far economically. Um, if there's a flaw in the security policy, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a flaw in the system. You know, it's basically like a, a layered defense, right? So the security program that's running is one layer, and then the policy is another layer. And so it, may, it often takes a, a conjunction of two flaws to actually get through the system. But the whole point of security policy is there as that guide rail. In case your program fails, you're going to limit the amount of damage that the program can do. If a hack attacker, say, gets into SendMail and takes control of it, you're going to limit the kind of access they have. So um, just to wrap it up here, there's a lot of economic factors driving this analysis. When I first started, it was going to be all ivory tower stuff. We're going to, we're going to do everything right down to the metal. We're going to assure things. We're going to, there will be no unemployed mathematicians in Minneapolis because they're going to be all proving this code. Well, in the end, it turns out we couldn't afford all the mathematicians. And they're now writing software for other companies. But um, it, you, economics becomes a huge factor, factor in computer security. And I just can't stress that enough. Because even when you're doing an analysis within certain time constraints, you just can't analyze everything. You have to pick the most effective things to analyze and look at those first. Stop the overt channels before you start looking for the covert channels. Covert channels are still important. But if you don't close the overt channels, you're not really getting the most bang for your buck. Um, so you basically have to pick the most effective analysis. Basically, the security policy is there as an economics tool. It is sometimes much more economical to change your security policy than to change your software. Even though the right thing to do is to change the software, maybe you can't afford it, but you can change the policy and you can get a, at least some sort of fix out of the deal. And basically, the bottom line here is just because security policy is hard, there's no reason to ignore it. It really is a significant engineering effort that needs to be analyzed and uh, and hopefully we can build up a better uh, science of policy engineering with uh, you know, courses and everything. So that's my talk. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. We do have another lecture coming in here afterward. Yes. Um, our, in SC Linux, our policies just uh, allow, I mean, uh, positive things? No, nope, you have denies as well. Okay. And, you have, and you can also have constraints. So I can specify, say in that policy file I was talking about, I can say nobody else should have access to this file except these things that I've listed here. So if you specify all these constraints, you can kind of cover yourself, but it's not as good as scoping because you have to seriously think and put them all the exceptions in. And so it becomes set up where it's possible. And so there, it's, very, it's a very flexible, powerful language. And I, 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 it's, I hope I didn't give you the impression that it's, it's, it's flawed. It's, it's, it's just where we are today. It, we have to just start adding more abstractions to it now that we've learned to work with this, you know, put in scoping rules and stuff. Yes? Uh, I think you touched on this <clears throat> earlier when you were talking about your concerns about the relabeling uh, mm -hmm. operation in particular. Um, let's imagine for a moment that SendMail has uh, buffer overflow vulnerability and right. it's exploited. It, does the system still recognize that as send mail, or, or could it possibly recognize it as something else? No, the, the system would still recognize it as send mail. The whole point of type enforcement is to prevent send mail from then um, launching into other attacks. What, when I was at Secure Computing, we actually had a, a challenge for our firewall. We let you log into the firewall, and we gave you a whole suite of tools. And they say, you're in a domain. See if you can get out. And so basically, that's the point. So you could do, you know, it still thought you were send mail, even though you're running a shell. But then we, let, we restricted your access. That, that, that was my concern, because uh, there is a strong reliance on the fact that um, once something is exploited, it's still going to be recognized as the same thing right. by, by the system. And, and in reality, right, there are still are holes out of send mail to the rest of the system. And now, if you have a shell command, can you get through those holes? That becomes the next question. You've, but you've raised the bar. You've made it a lot harder. Uh, more questions. Yes. Yes. Uh, I heard you mention send mail a lot of times. So yes, it's fun to pick on send mail. Yeah, I would like to know if there are other programs. I mean, the whole point is minimizing the trusted programs. Okay. Those are the programs that kind of throw the wrench in the you know, works. And well, they raise the cost. I mean, if it was cheap to do trusted programs, it would be great. You could trust everything. That would, be, that would be a fine solution. But the problem is economically, that's just too expensive. Like send mail, for example, that 
access a lot of resources that you don't know why they're accessing that would have, you know, if you just remove the program from the graph or, or right. the system, everything would be beautiful. Have you come across in your experience? In, in the specific program? analysis I've done, I found specific things, you know, of course, I'm analyzing things for very specific applications. I, I want to do more general analysis of the system, but I haven't had time. So, but that, that'd be a great research project. So. Yes. Um, oh, oh, behind you. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> How do you handle patch management and upgrades? Does that mean you can you can you can build uh, you could build that into your policy, right? You could have a patch manager cell where it has the ability to change the executable, but you put a filter in front of it so that maybe it can only be loaded you know, through the system administrator, um, and then it has the ability to change this executable or patch it or wouldn't run whatever stuff. Now, a program like RPM, eh, it'd be a little bit more tricky because RPM has a lot of permissions because it touches a lot of different things. And I mean, RPM, I think, is another good example of the program that touches a lot more stuff than what you'd want it to touch. But if you came, you could, you can envision a very specific program that could do some very specific patch management. How are we doing on time? Yeah. We got to go? We got to go. All right. I can hang out in the hall if you want to have more questions. Thank you. <laughs>